for your webinar. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for coming um, uh, for the uh, Kenny Drash Memorial Lecture. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Dorothy Becker. Um, I was Division Chief of Pediatric Endocrinology and Diabetes um, a while ago, and I'm stepping in for Dr. Radhika Mazumdar, who was unable to be here today. And it gives me a lot of pleasure to be able to come back and introduce this lecture. I think I'm one of about three people in this room who had ever worked with both Dr. Kenny and Dr. Drash. Um, and one of these days, there weren't a lot of people who worked with Dr. Kenny won't be here, but um, most of you in endocrinology know Dr. Drash. Um, so Dr. Kenny was the division chief when I arrived uh, from South Africa. Um, in 1974, and he and Dr. Drash really put uh, pediatric endocrinology and Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh on the map. Uh, at that time, uh, Fritz Kenny uh, trained with, uh, in Baltimore, initially with Lawson Wilkins of the Lawson Wilkins textbook, and then Bob Blizzard. And he recruited Alan Drash to Pittsburgh and so the two of them uh, were a, uh, a, a force that was known uh, nationally and internationally. So Fritz um, was a triple threat. He um, was an incredible mentor, teacher, clinician, but he was also the first person to, um, to look at the... Uh, cortisol secretion rate in, in children um, and really put steroid uh, endocrinology um, to the forefront of uh, pediatric endocrinology, which at the time some of us called chicken wire endocrinology. And uh, Selma Witchell, who is uh, on the way today, um, I think uh, started her career in chicken wire endocrinology um, influenced by uh, Fritz Kenny. Um, come on. Okay. Uh, so Alan Drash uh, was the director of pediatric endocrinology from 1975 to 1990. Um, he was known by many people as the father of pediatric diabetes, and believe it or not, was the first one to show insulin deficiency in uh, pediatric uh, diabetes. Um, at that time, type 2 diabetes was already known. Um, he was the first to bring the insulin in, in the assay to uh, pediatrics. And the first, when he was a trainee, I think, to use disoxide for the treatment of hyperinsulinism, also in Baltimore. Um, both children of uh, Lawson Wilkins of the pediatric, uh, pediatric Endocrine Textbook. So a couple of his, us here are maybe grandchildren. Peter Lee is in the audience, and I are maybe grandchildren of Lawson Wilkins. Um, and Lawson Wilkins didn't know or didn't think diabetes was part of endocrinology. So um, Alan really uh, put that into uh, pediatric endocrine realm um, around the world. I think for all of you fellows, I hope you're listening, and uh, young people, um, Alan was a hard worker. Um, he did go home to his family at 5.30 every night, irrespective of uh, whether there were patients in clinic or not. But he... This is a letter he wrote to his daughter. There's nothing more important than to be consumed by a sense of dedication and responsibility to a calling that takes one out of oneself and to the service of others. 
I could get by with doing far less than I do, but I love my work and the wonderful opportunities it has provided me. I'm excited every day when I get up and start work because I know I'll be presented with new chances to advance knowledge and help others. And I think that that maybe epitomizes um, Selma Witchell's approach to um, her work in pediatric endocrinology. Um, Selma is um, nationally and internationally known for her work in uh, uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, polycystic ovarian disease, um, was uh, chair of uh, the Androgen Society, International Androgen Society. She's the past uh, director of our Pediatric Endocrine Fellowship Program at Children's Hospital. She's had a number of positions uh, in the Pediatric Endocrine Society, Endocrine Society, amongst many others. Um, so Selma, um, we're looking forward to your lecture and congratulations on Thank being you. a Kenny Drash awardee. By the way, our Kenny Drash lecturers are chosen for being a, uh, a, a nationally and internationally known lecturer. So the fact that Selma comes from Pittsburgh, born, bred, and only left once to go to Cincinnati for her, um, her residency, she's gone through the ranks of being a high school student, a medical student, a fellow, all the way up to Professor Emeritus, which is what she is now. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Okay. It's really an honor and a privilege to be here today. And normally I'm in your seats watching the Kenny Drash lecture, who've been selected among um, first Dr. Kenny students and peers. Um, and I'm sort of a grandchild. Um, so it's really an honor to be chosen to give this talk today. So um, my talk today is Butterfly Kisses, Ladybug Hugs, Frogs, and Shiny Trucks. So we're going to talk about boys, girls, and sex development. Okay, and let's see. There's the right button, I hope. There. So I don't have anything to disclose. And as Dr. Becker alluded to, I started in this career a long time ago. I was a college student at Oberlin and trying to figure out what should I do with my life. I had sort of ruled out being a physician, but many of my, my relatives were physicians. I thought, well, let's see what, what I could learn. And so through a series of family relationships and connections, I was able to spend a month shadowing doctors Kenny and Drash, and it changed the rest of my life. Um, okay. So I spent a month shadowing Dr. Kenny. He was the epitome of the triple threat. He was a kind, caring clinician. He was a dedicated educator, and his intellectual curiosity was just amazing. And we did, as, as Dr. Becker said, we did chicken wire endocrinology in terms of learning about steroids. So I was imprinted and then I was reinforced by Mark Sperling during my pediatric residency and then uh, Drs. Becker, Lee and Drash during my fellowship. And Dr. Drash had a particular talent. I would, for my first endocrine society abstract, I spent, and yet this is the day where we didn't have board processors. We had to handwrite pieces of paper, double space to hand it to the mentor to correct with red ink. Okay. I spent the first, I spent eight weeks writing my first abstract. Okay. And I was rewriting, rewriting, rewriting. Finally, I gave it to Dr. Drash. It came back perfect in five minutes, or actually less than five minutes. He had this amazing talent to turn garbage writing into amazing prose within minutes. Um, it's something I've tried to emulate. Hopefully I'm getting closer. I can now whip out an abstract in 60 sec in 60 minutes, but I just don't have his talent yet. He was truly amazing. Um, with this, I'd like to acknowledge my friends, my peers, mentors throughout my career who have traveled with me on my learning journey. Um, and now to the subject at hand, okay. 
So the prevalence of DSD is approximately four per 1,000 births, with 73% of them being boys with hypospadias. Discovery is limited by small size of families. Most of these disorders are associated with subfertility or infertility. These conditions are rare. And access to fetal gonadal tissue, where the action is happening in terms of gonadal differentiation, is extremely limited. The incidence of DSDs where sex assignment may be unclear at birth is estimated to be at 1.8 for 10,000 births. The clinical management of these situations is complex and requires specialized care by a multidisciplinary team. Team members are, in addition to pediatric endocrinologists, your pediatric urology, ethics, gynecology, pathology, parent support groups, behavioral health and social work, radiology, genetics, nursing support, and us to help support the family in this process. Just so we're all on the same page, I want to go over some definitions. Um, sex is defined, assigned at birth based on the appearance of the external genitalia. This assignment carries a set of assumptions regarding the underlying internal genital anatomy and the hormone tissue actions that will occur with aging. It is descriptive and not prescriptive. So from the external genitalia at birth, we're predicting what the internal genitalia look like and what's going to happen at puberty. Gender is a personal concept of self-identity that describes behavioral, psychological, and social traits present in a given culture. Gender identity is an individual's personal understanding of their place in society and culture. Gender identity reflects and integrates biology, development, socialization, and culture. Gender expression is the outward manifestation of the intersection between gender identity and environment via choices in behavior and dress. Gender, gender identity, and gender expression are linked and may or may not be congruent. So we'll start back in 1331 about Guillaume Castello. He petitioned the court to acknowledge his marriage to Baron Garrett because she was unable to have intercourse. He sought the expertise of a local surgeon who conducted a thorough gynecologic exam. After this exam, the surgeon concluded that she had a male penis and testicles like a man. So for as long as humans have struggled with and enjoyed the existence of two sexes, they have tried to understand how this crucial difference came about. The answer to these questions has been debated by philosophers and scientists for over 3,000 years. So this slide depicts an engraving of Adam and Eve by Albert Durer, which depicts our Judaic Christian traditions about creation stories. But if you actually go back and look at the Old Testament, it was written in Hebrew and used the word zela, which means side and not rib. This interpretation would imply that Eve was created from Adam's side and that the original being was both male and female. And this is consistent with ancient myths from the Middle East and even in the Greeks that according to Greek mythology, humans were originally created with four arms, four legs, and a head and two faces. The external genitalia could be male-female, male-male, or female-female, recognizing the existence of heterosexuality and homosexuality. Now, Zeus, the Greek god, feared that these creatures were more powerful than he, so he split them into two separate beings, condemning them to spend the rest of their lives in search of their other halves. We also needed to explain hermaphrodites. So another Greek myth is about Hermaphroditus, who was the son of Hermes and Aphroditus. And the story is that one day he was swimming in a pond by himself when this nymph Salmasis came along. He wanted nothing to do with her, but she cried to the Greek gods that she wanted to be fused with him for the rest of, of her life and his life. So that's how hermaphrodites came about. Hermaphrodites being an old term for what we would then call ambiguous genitalia or now would call atypical genitalia. So ancient Greek philosophers hypothesized that fetal position in the uterus, right or left, where the sperm came from, right testis, left testis, and or temperature of the four elements, fire, water, air, and earth, determine sex. The Hippocratic Corpus is actually a collection of medical writings by various authors, mostly written between 430 and 350 BC. Hippocrates was one of these, and he in the school of class viewed sex as a spectrum, reflecting various combinations of heat, cold, dryness and moisture to shape a body. Aristotle, a little later, noted that form embodied by semen was contributed by the male, and matter embodied by menstrual material was provided by the female. And again, they didn't do experiments. These are sort of thought about how, how creatures came about. Males were superior and had abundance of heat compared to females. 
Um, Aristotle thought that individuals with atypical genitalia represented a doubling of these materials. So either too much male piece, too much female piece, but all humans were either male or female. Aristotle indicated that sex was determined by the heat of the heart. He also noted that the heart and not the brain was responsible for all sensations. And that's another debate about what was more important than the brain or the heart. And Aristotle thought everything came from the heart. Okay. In the early common era, there was Galen, who was born in an area that's now Turkey. He moved to Rome in 162 AD. He was physician to gladiators, Roman emperors, and the general population. And he learned a lot about medicine by treating the gladiators for their various injuries. He believed that good health and sex development were dependent on the proper balance of the four humors, blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. He was very productive and wrote over 500 papers and books. He also wrote about the importance of good bedside manners, about being positive to the patient, um, consulting with your peers, and being you know, generally positively reinforcing to the patient. He, again, he believed that male and female gen external genitalia were actually inverse of each other. Okay. So we now come to the beliefs for sex determination and multiple births. The womb was considered to be cold and dry in temperament. Testicles were hot and dry. And the womb had seven cells with three on the right, three on the left, and one cell in the middle. And this allowed for multiple births. So males were in the cells on the right because it was by the liver and it was warm. Females were on the left where it was cold by the spleen. And the middle cell was reserved for the infants with atypical genitalia. But even back then, establishing sex was important for inheritance, power, guild membership, legal status, the ability to provide witness testimony, baptism, marriage, and entering the priesthood. So what was one to do with a person who seemed to be neither or both male or female? Everyone had to have one true permanent sex. But back then, not a whole lot was known about reproduction. In fact, it was called generation. So prior to the 17th century, the word generation encompassed reproduction, conception, and gestation. And spontaneous generation was considered to exist. And when my kids were little, my daughter Jess is here in the audience, we had Fisher Price little people and their little toys that they played with. I would put them away and every night, I swore that they reproduced by spontaneous generation because they're always more the next morning. But anyhow, back in the 17th century before that, they thought spontaneous generation existed. Mice could be generated from a dirty shirt or wheat grains. Dogs and cats could give birth to monsters. Vipers could be generated from dust. And as shown on this tree, fish and birds could come from trees. It wasn't until William Harvey came along who actually started doing experiments. And his real claim to fame is working out the details of the circulatory system. But towards the end of his life, he was contemplating reproduction. And he came to the conclusion, as you see by this illustration from his book, that all things come from an egg. Now, again, it wasn't our concept of, of an egg. Okay? The concept was a small human being lived in this egg. And when the egg was born, it then grew into a human being. And that was true for all animals. So following him, there were several other, sort of the beginning of real experimenters or researchers. There was Regnius de Graaf better known for the graphene follicle, Neil Stenson, known as Steno, and John Swammerdam. And later along, there was Luanoke, famous for microscopes. Steno and Stenson were classmates at the University of Leiden for medical school, and de Graaf was a little bit behind them, but they were all friends in, in medical school. And so let's talk a little bit about what Leiden was like back then. And this is a university. This is the 1660s. Okay? Leiden was a very busy trade town, uh, lots of merchants. Um, there were, the streets were cobblestones, and one heard the carts and carriages traveling over the cobblestones, the noises and smells of the marketplace. Window and plumbing had yet to be invented. Um, and the students there worked very hard, the medical students, from morning through dusk. But they, like medical students today, they partied hardy at night. And the University of Leiden, to attract medical students, gave them an annual allowance of about 200 liters of wine and almost 2,000 liters of beer. I, you know, UPMC didn't do that when I went to medical school. Um, anatomy was studied differently. And so, so anatomy was studied in theaters with the medical students. Other interested people could buy tickets and come. The you know, study of anatomy was pretty much lim limited to the winter months because it was too hot and smelly to do it during the summer months. And there was a dissector, and that's how people learn about anatomy. Okay. okay, today we can... 
click a button like I just did. We can send journals off. We can download articles. We can communicate. Back then, there were various societies. There was one in Italy, Paris. Probably the most famous one is the Royal Society of London, which was founded in 1660 by scientists that brought together leading scientific minds. And it's the oldest national scientific academy and also probably the, the oldest medical publication starting in March, 1665. Okay. And so these young scientists all wanted to have their work reviewed and published. Um, so starting with discovery, um, we have, you know, things had to go by boats, by planes, not by planes, by boat and by um, water to, to the Royal Society. So, but in terms of discovery, Steno, Swimmer, Dam, and De Graaff meet at the university. Steno suggests without any basis that women have eggs. Again, we're not quite sure what he means by eggs and whether the still, um, you know, William Harvey's description of an egg having a hatching, hatching or birthing a whole human being. De Graaff published detailed descriptions of male human genitalia, internal and external. And then Steno elected to leave science and he became a Catholic priest and nothing more is heard from him in terms of science. But de Graaff and Swire Dan became competitors to, first, to be the first to describe human eggs and ovaries. And they were sending publications to be reviewed by the Royal Society. The Royal Society was disputing their findings. They were sending letters back and forth to each other. And again, this didn't happen at the click of the button. This involved manuscripts and papers traveling over land and sometimes overseas. Lewinhock then wrote to the Royal Society to report the existence of spermatozoa, which were at that time were called animicules and were thought to be parasites. Somebody had suggested him to start looking at body fluids because he was fascinated with the microscope and he was not as originally trained as a scientist. So he started looking at body fluids and somebody brought him a semen sample and he found these things. And he started looking at semen from other creatures, including himself, and found what we now call a sperm. Continuing with discovery, Spell and Sani concluded that seminal liquid was necessary to fertilize eggs. So this was the first step that something from sperm and something from egg needed to be put together. He also proves that spontaneous generation doesn't happen. In 1827, Carl Ernst von Baer described the mammalian ovum inside the graphene follicle. So that's the first sighting of the egg as we now know it. Leidick and Sertoli described the cells named in their honor. And in 1878, using sea urchins, Oscar Hertwig observed a sperm cell head entering an egg and the fusion of the two nuclei. Two nuclei. So this is the first time that fertilization is actually observed. About 10 years later, Waldeyer described screen-like bodies that he called chromosomes based on their color appearance. And around the same time, in 1865, the Italian anatomist Luigi de Crecchio published his case report. So yes, case reports were published back then. So he described the cadaver as having a penis with urethral openings on its underside and undescended testes. To his surprise, the postmortem exam revealed a vagina, a uterus, fallopian tubes, and ovaries, as well as markedly large adrenal glands. The patient was born a female, was whose birth was registered as a female, was baptized as a female, and around age four, transitioned to be a male. And so this patient grew up as a male. He worked as a butler for a family. And as working as a butler, he became romantically involved with the maid who lived in the household. They went to church seeking whatever they needed to do to, to be married. And the church said, you can't get married because he was baptized as a girl and they would not marry them. Um, he then apparently had um, sexually transmitted diseases, Several, but ultimately had several episodes of vomiting, diarrhea, and prostation, and died, presumably of acute adrenal insufficiency. So this is our first report of somebody, a, a virilized female with salt, with non-salt losing or simple virilizing congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Nettie Maria Stevens and Edmund Beecher Wilson independently described the XXXY chromosome system. So there was now something special about the Y chromosome and sex determination. Next, we have Alfred Yost in the 1940s. Um, Dr. Yost was French and he had grown up on a farm and he was a physician investigator. And so this summarizes his works on sex differentiation. On the top left is the panel is the bipotential stage where the gonads have not yet differentiated to be ovaries or testes. And at this stage, 
both malarian and wolfian ducks are present. He worked with fetal rabbits. So the top right is the normal female rabbit with the presence of malarian ducks because there aren't any testes. The middle is the male where there's testes in this fetus and only the wolfian ducks are present. And then he castrated the, a male fetal rabbit and lo and behold, what happened? The malarian ducks were present, but the wolfian ducks were gone. So there was something about the testes that influenced how the internal gonads were developing. He then um, grafted a testis in a fetal rabbit male. And with that on the side of the ovary, the malarian duck persisted because that was the normal development. Then a little bit more of the wolfian duck. On the side where the testis was grafted, the wolfian duck persisted, but the malarian duck degenerated. So again, there's something about the testis that influenced development of the internal ducts. And at this point, various steroids had already been created, including testosterone had been synthesized. So he said, well, maybe it's something about testosterone. I need to investigate this further. So what he did in his next experiment with a fetal male rabbit was to place a testosterone crystal. And with a crystal where testosterone was then circulated throughout the body, he found that the malarian ducts were present on both sides, as well as the, the wolfian ducts, because the testosterone stabilized the wolfian ducts and AMH, anti-malarian hormone, also known as malaria inhibitory hormone, was not present because there wasn't a testis. So this is sort of the background to understanding sex differentiation of the internal genital duct systems. Okay. So clearly there's something about the Y chromosome, something about testosterone and the testes. So these researchers, with the help of patients, started looking at what genetic material was present in patients whose karyotype was XX, but they were developed as males. And it turns out there were four patients who were XX karyotype, but whose phenotype was male. And what these individuals had in common was about a 35 KB region on the short arm of the Y chromosome. So these scientists created several transgenic XX mice who carried the transgene for the mouse SRY gene. Human gene didn't work because human gestation is longer than mouse and activation of this gene is very time dependent and is very brief. So they created Randy. And if you can see, there's a picture of Randy um, the researchers wrote, you know, it was harder to get Randy to pose for his picture than to create him. Um, but Randy looked like a male mouse. And more importantly, he acted like a male mouse. They put him in a, in a cage with female mice where he promptly mounted, mounted the mice and acted like a male mouse as well. So with this, it became clear, this is sort of proof for the pudding, that the SRY gene was the gene that caused male sex development. So sex determination and development first starts the formation of the bipotential gonad that really involves precise coordination of morphogenesis, cell migration, proliferation, and cell fate specification. So cells have to sort of say, oh, I'm going to wake up to tomorrow and I'm going to be a testes or an ovary. And it depends on the environment and the expression of various genes and proteins. This process reflects a tightly regulated complex process that depends on the actions and the interactions both of positive and negative genetic signals within this fetal environment. And these genetic signals interact or create a regulatory net network functioning in a precise spatial temporal manner. So things happen in utero that we have no clue about because it's, it's done in the past. Sex development involves three stages. There's development of the bipotential gonad, sex determination, and sex development. The gonads, internal genital ducts, and external genital structures all develop from bipotential embryonic tissues. And sex determination is the process through which the male or female gonad is determined. Is it XX or XY? Okay. So the SRY gene is truly the binary switch for sex determination. Okay. If SRY is present, then the gonad develops to, it's a normal SRY, develops to be a testis. Okay. In the absence of SRY, the gonad develops to be an ovary. And of course, life isn't so simple. Okay. So SRY turns on the SOX9 gene and the FGF9 genes, and this becomes a fast forward cycle to promote development of the testis along with other genes. And we used to think naively that ovarian development was just default. No SRY, no testis, you have an ovary. Okay. Well, again, we were wrong. 
Okay. So there are certain genes, there's spondin 1, FOXL2, beta continin that promote ovarian development. And not only do they promote ovarian development, they turn off testicular development. And genes that promote testicular development turn off ovarian development. So there's a yin-yang with positive negative regulation with these genes talking to each other in utero, as well as throughout life, to make sure they're balanced and turning off the undesired, in a way, reproductive tract. Now, again, going back to the development of the internal genital structures on the left in the XY fetus, Sertoli cells secrete AMH that leads to malaria duct regression and testosterone stabilizes the Wolfian ducts to become the vas deferens. In the female, the absence of testosterone leads to degeneration of the Wolfian duct and absence of AMH allows persistence of, of the malaria ducts. Again, things aren't so simple. On the left, it's the Wolfian duct and in the XX fetus, the Coop transcription factor two suppresses FGF expression in the Wolfian epithelium, and then this causes um, the Wolfian ducts to degenerate. In the XY fetus, androgens ex inhibit expression of this transcription factor, and the Wolfian ducts persist. In the female with the malaria ducts, fetal testis, Sertoli cells make MH that binds to the AMH receptor, initiating a signal cascade so the malaria ducts regress. Okay. In the female, AMH receptor is made, but there's no AMH, so the malaria ducts persist. Looking at the external genitalia, this is a very old color-coded diagram with genital tubercle, genital fold, and genital swellings. And again, the take-home message, in the presence of testosterone, the male pattern takes place, and it's testosterone and dihydrotestosterone. Back in 2006, and Dr. Lee, who's sitting here, was one of my mentors in 2016, scientists got together to try and develop a classification system or framework so that we would have a more unified approach to the diagnosis and management of patients with DSDs, um, which differences or variations in sex development. So on the far left are sex chromosome DSD, 45X Turner syndrome, 47XXY Kleinfelder, 45X, 46XY mixed canal dysgenesis, and very rarely 46XX, 46XY chimeric overtesticular. In the middle are 46XY DSD, the barren testicular development, disorders of androgen synthesis or action, disorders of AMH synthesis or action, and on the far right, 46XX DSD, aberrant ovarian development, disorders of androgen excess, predominantly girls with congenital adrenal hyperplasia, and fatter vaginal or uterine atresia. So this is a study from one center at Great Ormond Street in the UK looking at variants in sex development in their center. So this is a retrospective study looking at 25 years. The median number of cases is about 23 per year. And the most common karyotype was 46XY with almost half being 46XY raised as boy. There were about just over 10% raised as girls. Most of these patients presented in the newborn period with atypical genitalia, but, but about 20% presented past the newborn period. But again, of that, about 40% 40 still had atypical genitalia, and there are a number of other etiologies that led to medical presentation. So how does this process go awry? Are there changes in gene expression, gene regulation, sex chromosome complementation, a sex link, and we're probably only dealing with the tip of the iceberg in terms of our knowledge of genetics. There can be gene-gene, protein-protein interactions, things that are stage or time-specific, epigenetic, locus-specific, microRNA, non-coding sequences. So we're still in the process of learning about sex development. This slide lists some of the common reasons that we can diagnose today. There's sex chromosome aneuploidy, Disorders of stereogenesis at the top differences in malaria and wolfing duct development. And on the far right are lists of single genes in which variations have been identified in patients with DSDs. Okay. And patients with DSD may have changes that are not limited to their external genitalia. They may have syndromes. For example, there's Dennis Drash syndrome that Dr. Drash described. Um, there's CHARD syndrome, which took associated with changes in the CHD7, smith lemley opitz So there may he changes in other parts of the body related to the genetic etiology. It's also important to remember that not all abnormalities of external genital development are genetic endocrine. Okay? 
Okay, there can be general absence of the vas deferens, nails with cystic fibrosis, bladder or cloacal extrophy, aphalia, penoscrotal transposition, and isolated hypospadias. So coming back to, to Berengaria, we don't have any more details about her. We don't know what happened to her. We don't know how she felt about this whole situation. And looking back with, with our lens, we can only guess she may have 5-alpha reductase deficiency or 70 uh, ketosteroid or 17 ketosteroid dehydrogenase deficiency. These are disorders that in the XY individual, okay, this is XY individual who has testes, but the external genitalia don't develop in utero because of the lack of testosterone or dihydric testosterone. So at birth, they may be assigned to female gender. Okay. As these individuals grow and develop and have puberty, with puberty, they have a, their testes are there, they're stimulated to see secrete testosterone, and these individuals virilize. Okay. So group, uh, patients with 5-alpha reductase were described in the Dominican Republic where they changed sex of, of or person from female to male at puberty. So we can only guess that this is what happened for her. Okay. So let's do some cases. Let's be practical. Okay. So this is a 12-hour-old infant with atypical external genitalia. The external genitalia were symmetric. No gonads were palpable, no other anomalies were noted. There was no family history of atypical genitalia or early family deaths. And in the pink, I've circled what the genitalia looked like for this infant, okay? So the clitoris is large, there's fusion of the labia majora, there's a single opening on the perineum. What could this baby have, okay? So we're being endocrinologists, we always draw blood, so we looked at blood samples. So we sent off a 70-hydroxy progesterone and we went, sent it to a specific lab because the newborn has a lot of steroids to come from the placenta and can cross-react in traditional radio immunoassays. So we sent it off to esoterics for a specific assay, and the 70-hydroxy progesterone, as I would call it, is gigunda high. It's over 30,000 nanograms per deciliter. This infant has a uterus, and the karyotype is 46XX. So this is a virilized XX infant with congenital adrenal hyperplasia due to 21 hydroxylase deficiency. So it's now time to talk to the family. So we share with them that they have a girl, they have a daughter who has congenital adrenal hyperplasia, that she has normal ovaries and uterus and with proper care can have grandchildren for them. We examine the, the baby with parents, showing them what we see. So that to them, they feel comfortable changing their baby's diaper. We review the pathophysiology of congenital adrenal hyperplasia. We discuss that this baby has glucocorticoid and mineralocorticoid deficiencies and talk about hormone replacement therapy. Because this baby has primary adrenal insufficiency, we talk about glucocorticoid stress dosing and about oral and parental treatment when the child is, has physiologic stress. We talk about genetics and recurrence risk because this is an autosomal recessive disorder. And we discuss the importance of obtaining medical alert ID because one never knows when an accident will happen. The diagnosis of CH needs to be considered for infants with a phallus. A phallus means penis or clitoris. So it's it can be used interchangeably, but with an enlarged clitoris or what looks to be a small penis and no palpable gonads, especially if hypospadias is present. If considering this diagnosis, order 70 hydroxyprogesterone rather than waiting for the newborn screening to come back. Okay. Pennsylvania and all other 49 states and many countries in Europe have mandatory screening for 21 hydroxylase deficiency. Okay. Unfortunately, the results tend, generally don't come back till babies are. 10 to, to 14 days old. And by that time, a baby with classic salt losing CH could be dead. So if you suspect it, order the test. And with that, assure that the lab uses liquid chromatography tandem methodology to minimize false positive results. And this shows the baby's genotype. Okay? So this baby has two complete loss of function variants. So this baby would have the phenotype, as we would see, is complete classic salt losing CAH. And again, you, say, you might say, well, why don't we just read the genetics? And that's a story for another day because the, comp the genetics of this loci are extremely complicated. Um, and so I won't go into that and bore you today. But this is one example where hormone testing precedes the genetics. So not all babies, individuals with DSD present in the newborn period. This is a 15-year-old girl referred to endocrinology for evaluation of primary amenorrhea and delayed puberty. She presented at 10 years of age with abdominal pain and abdominal mass to RED. And this is, story goes back a long time ago. We were still in the old building on DeSoto Street. 
She was diagnosed with left ovarian mixed germ cell tumor with elements typical of dysgerminoma and teratoma. She is treated with surgical excision and chemotherapy. And this is the tissue specimen. She had dysgerminoma and teratoma. And this is her left ovary specimen from her original surgery. Several years later, she, she didn't have any findings of puberty. She was sent to endocrinology to inquire why didn't she have puberty? Well, again, we're endocrinologists. We draw bloods. We do karyotypes. Her gonadotropins were extremely high, indicating that she had primary ovarian insufficiency or gonadoinsufficiency at that point. Um, her androstenedione dione was normal. Her pelvic ultrasound showed a uterus. Her karyotype was 46XY. And we were fortunate and able to obtain single gene testing. And it turns out that she had a loss of function variant in the SRY gene. So she had a disorder that disrupted the function of her SRY gene from the beginning. And for that reason, she had malarian ducts persisted, Wolfian ducts regressed, and she presented. So next, a word of, about, so she had gonadogenesis. We talked with her family and her regarding her chromosomes. We talked about her right ovary. We didn't know about her right ovary. Could she have a germ cell tumor? Did she need to have a second surgery? What about her family? She would likely have a family by adoption in the future because she was likely going to be infertile. And we also had to talk about hormone replacement therapy. So fetal development of germ cells is governed by a process involving specification, migration, and development of proper gonadal niche. Because germ cells develop outside the gonad and migrate into the gonad about five to six weeks gestation. And if they go to the wrong spot, they typically undergo apoptosis. But in a gonad that's abnormal with an aberrant microenvironment, they can undergo, they can be arrested or they can give rise to germ cell tumors. And prolonged expression of germ cell markers and the extent of testicular development, in other words, presence of Y chromosome and testicular development influence the development of germ cell tumors. Germ cell neoplasia in situ and gonadoblastoma are the most common germ cell tumors and precede the development of other more invasive neoplasms. And we had we published um, in the past couple of years a five-month-old who had mixed gonadogenesis and already had gonadoblastoma in the gonads. So it's something that we need to be conscious about. This may happen very early. So fortunately for her, she went back, had a second surgery, and did not have germ cell tumor. She just had a street gonad and an unremarkable fallopian tube. Okay. Fortunately, she had hormone replacement therapy and has done well. So DSD can present after the neonatal period. Classic one that we see is short girl with decelerating growth velocity. We need to think about Turner syndrome. And I think that's really important for general pediatricians to be aware of because we have seen patients who've been referred in when they're 12 or 13 for delayed puberty who've been clearly falling off the growth curve for a year. And by that point, there's not a whole lot we can do with growth hormone. Um, so it would be nice to think about that diagnosis earlier. Patients with gonadal tumors, delayed pubertal development, virilization, either a boy who's virilizing at the age of six or the adolescent girl who's showing signs of virilization or individuals with specific syndrome. So we'll talk about another, our third patient for the morning. And this is baby A, who is about the three kilo product of a 39 week gestation to a 27 year old grab three pair two mom. The prenatal ultrasound showed a renal anomaly, likely a horseshoe kidney, and non-invasive prenatal screening showed a 45X karyotype. So the parents had been counseled to expect a baby girl with Turner syndrome, and they were comfortable with knowing that they were going to have a baby with Turner syndrome who was going to meet the endocrinologist and be followed by the endocrinologist throughout. However, life delivers su surprises. And after birth, this baby had atypical asymmetric genitalia, Peroneal hypospadias, a palpable left gonad, no masses in the right inguinal area, slightly rugated labial folds, and a well developed phallus indicating that this baby had seen testosterone in utero. There was a blind ending hit at the tip of the phallus. No other external anomalies were present, and there was no puffiness of the extremities that we would expect with a baby girl with Turner syndrome. Okay. So, again, we're endocrinologists, we start doing imaging studies. Renal ultrasound confirmed the horseshoe kidney, which is something typical with Turner syndrome. There's increased renal echogenicity, some pelvic pelvocalviectasis. The ultrasound showed a uterus. There was a gonad in the left labium hemiscrotum, no gonadal tissue on the right. The adrenal glands appeared normal, and a cardiac echo on day two was unremarkable. We did set off chromosomes, and we were surprised. There were three cell lines. 
about three quarters of the cell showed one signal for the X chromosome and no signals for the SRY consistent with the monosomy X. And this is what had likely been picked up on the non-invasive prenatal screening. There was about 20% of the cells that showed one signal for the X and an SRY. So likely one cell line was 46XY. And then there were less than, just less than 10% of the cell showed one signal for X and two signals for SRY. How did this come about? Well, metaphase fish showed a pseudo isodicentric Y chromosome comprised of two YP 11.32 to Q terminal segments that were stuck together at the band 11 p 32 So just to show what that looks like, okay. So on the top, we see monosomy X on the top right. Um, in the middle, there's sort of a stain that shows X and, and one SRY, and on the top, the X and two SRY genes in a cell. So on the bottom left is the actual chromosome appearance of the isodecentric Y with two centromeres and two SRY genes because two pieces of the Y chromosome are, are missing um, the very tips of the short ends and are stuck together. And on the bottom right is the cartoon showing two centromeres and the SRY gene. Okay. So this is a time for what I call shared decision-making. We need to clarify what decisions. We have this child, okay? Parents were thought they were having a girl, but the phenotype wasn't typical for a girl or certainly a girl for Turner syndrome and suggested a sort of mixed gonadal dysgenesis. And there was a palpable gonad and palpable gonads are usually have testicular elements. Ovaries typically don't go down into the pelvis. So we had to figure out what we were gonna decide, gather what information we needed, explore the decision, what value knows, and these are conversations that our team was having with the parents. These are not us, the medical team in isolation, the conversations in person. Um, fortunately, our UPMC had the ability for us to do video visits because the family did not live five minutes away. And so we had lots of conversations, both in person and virtually, um, to talk about what was important, what their values were, and to plan where we go next and identify what our certainty was. So things we considered, we had to acknowledge this was a really complex situation. Should this child be raised as a girl or as a boy? We had to, to recognize that there were signs of virilization in terms of the external genitalia. So that meant that this baby's brain had seen androgens in utero. Okay? And so the brain may have been masculized. What sort of testicular function was in that, that gonad? Was it a relatively normal testis that would enable puberty to happen spontaneously at the time of puberty? What about fertility? Were there germ cells there? If we were contemplating what to do next, what kind of surgery would need to be done? Okay. If, we, if the parents and the patient wanted surgery. Okay. What about, again, I had just shared with you about another patient with tumor risk. So this is a patient that has a Y chromosome. Is there a risk for a tumor in the left gonad? Or what's on the right side? Is it an abdominal testes? We didn't know. So the newborn screening, as we would suspect was inconsistent with CAH. FSH was 9.6, suggesting that maybe there was some connection and communication between the hypothalamus pituitary and testing. So again, suggesting that this testis was functional and the testosterone was 86 nanograms. Not a lot to write home about, but a lot, enough to say this testis might be making testosterone. So again, with discussions with the parents, um, we decided they and we collectively decided that they would feel comfortable raising this as a baby boy. Um, and again, I'm happy to say he's doing well um, and is now uh, two and a half years old, okay? So we come back to sort of our subject at hand, indications for DSD evaluation. A normal periphallus with or without hypospadies, bilateral non-palpable gonads, a virilized female, an apparent female with inguinal labial mass and asymmetry of the external genitalia, a family history of DSD, um, oftentimes, there's a maternal aunt with complete androgen sensitivity, prenatal or postnatal discordance between genetic genital appearance and karyotype, an abnormal phallus, too large for a girl, too small for a boy, a syndrome with overt genital ambiguity, like smith lumley opitz or delayed or absent puberty. What do we do? Talk, take a history, environment, disruptors can cause abnormalities in general development, maternal virilization during pregnancy, take a detailed family history, we do a thorough physical exam. Are there other anomalies? Are gonads palpable? Are external genitalia symmetric? Examine the phallus and identify the erythromiatus. Are the labia fused? Are the genitalia hyperpigmented? And show the external genitalia to the parents so that they see what we see. Okay. With difference in sex development, 
Testis can be in multiple locations. There's normal in the scrotum and be suprascrotal, or it could be even in the abdomen. And before you call the urologist, tell them where the urethromeatus is located. Is it on the glands penis or is it on the perineum? So our initial approach is based on history and exam, no palpable gonads, no other anomalies, bilateral palpable gonads, atypical external genitalia, and other anomalies, and one palpable gonad. We do laboratory studies, karyotypes, hormone levels, electrolytes, plasma renin, additional studies as necessary. Okay. We now are more reliant on the genetic toolbox. Figure A shows how we used to operate. We did clinical phenotype, we waited for the hormone levels to come back, and then we cherry picked the gene that we were going to be interested in. Okay, I think now given the availability and extent of, ge of genetic analysis to help us with this, we approach use genetic analysis earlier in the diagnosis. We look for chromosomal aneuploidy, um, deletions, duplications, insertions, and rearrangements for structural chromosome, and start looking for single nucleotide and copy number variants. A couple other considerations: surgery, fertility, preservation, transition of care. So for surgery, we want to reduce the risk for urinary tract infections. Again, I mentioned gonadal neoplasia. We need to think about the genital anatomy, having thinking about preserving sexual sensitivity when these are adults. We want to reduce stigmatization re related to a typical genital anatomy and respond to parents, which is represent thinking about the fact that this baby is an infant. The baby doesn't even understand what we're talking about in terms of chromosomes or plans. So genital surgery has become the most controversial aspect of DSC management. There's no consensus regarding time or the specific procedure. It may decrease the anxiety of parents and maybe the patients. We don't have any evidence-based data on outcome without surgery. And most importantly, the patient is too young to understand and consent to any irreversible surgical procedures. For fertility, again, is now more of a consideration. Some patients have high risk for gonadal malignancy. The gonads can be removed and gonadal tissue or gametes can be frozen. For disorders such as Kleinfeller's where there's progressive loss of germ cells, fertility preservation can be performed. For patients who lack malarian structures, XX, uterine transplants have been successful so that these women can have a uterine transplant and carry a pregnancy. For individuals who have genetic disorders, you can do genetic counseling, pre-plantation genetic diagnosis and in vitro fertilization. And even for complete androgen insensitivity, with the gonad being a testis, individuals are considering um, tissue preservation. Transition begins in childhood in terms of preparing the parents and the young adult for transition. So we need accurate diagnosis, therapeutic interventions, assess pubertal development in the early teen years with hormone determinations and imaging studies. I like to have train the parents how to tell their child about their chromosomes at home. I don't like having everybody come in and I sit there with white coat and round circle and we're waiting for the announcement. Okay, it's very artificial. So I tell parents from very early on to talk about their child has a difference in how they're going to grow and have puberty and have families. And we gently talk about that in the office. Um, and so I have found it much more successful for parents to share information. And we I expand on that in the office. By the time a young adult graduates high school, they need to know their diagnosis, their karyotype, and family planning options. We need to talk about romantic relationships, sex education, and optimal procedures to facilitate sexual intercourse like vaginal dilation, and continue dialogue for the emerging adult and eventual transfer to a knowledgeable adult care provider. So just some take home messages, okay? Pregnancy test comes back positive. Everybody wants to know, particularly now, are you having a boy or a girl, okay? We now have gender reveal parties, okay? Should we buy pink, should we buy blue? So when a child with atypical genitalia is born, parents feel guilty, angry, and disappointed with their perfect child. Talk to the parents. And if you go on the Pediatric Endocrine website, there's actually a delightful parent education video. I had the pleasure of working on it. Canty helped as well that is a short video introduction the parents can watch again. They can show it to the grandparents. They can show it to other family members to talk about sex development, but talk to the parents. Parents ask, why me? Why my child? Did I do something wrong? What if I can't love my child? They're waiting for us doctors to tell them something else bad. Um, is there more bad news to come? What am I gonna tell my family and friends? And then denial is a very powerful drug. Can't I just make this all go away? 
So practical issues, don't panic, consult us, okay? show the child's genitalia to the parents, discuss the process of sex differentiation and development in the words that the parents can understand and repeat it okay? multiple times. Okay? Inform the parents that they will be involved in this process to determine the sex of rearing for their child. Suggest that they delay naming the child, which this can be a challenge at McGee. Okay, the ladies at McGee come around within 24 hours and get to get the baby's names. So you have to have an active process to tell the parents. Parents have been often thinking about names for their children for years, okay? and certainly throughout the pregnancy. And now that the baby often has had a sex assigned by prenatal invasive the screening, they have a plan. Okay, they should not have to use name their child a unisex name just because we can't identify what the external genitalia look like, okay? Delay naming the baby. And importantly for us and for the staff, do not call the child it, he, or she. Rather, talk about your baby. I have a family that, that had a, a daughter with you know, classic salt losing 21 hydroxylase deficiency that in the delivery room, the nurse announced to mom, oh, you have an adorable baby boy. Okay? This family recognized and understood very quickly that they had a baby girl with congenital adrenal hyperplasia. But for years, mom still had this neglecting thought about maybe they really had a boy. Okay? But they had a girl, and I'm pleased now she's finishing her second year of medical school. Okay. So it's a team, team sport, team approach. Um, it's always going to be difficult for a woman to find out that she is genetically a male. The general belief for a woman to find out that she has male chromosomes would be too great a shock for her to bear. Consequently, with the best interest of the patient in mind, it has been common practice for doctors not to disclose the true nature of the condition. When parents are told, they too get drawn into the conspiracy of silence. The result is a web of lives from parents and doctors, the very people we are expected to trust most. It is highly likely that this policy of secrecy has caused more damage than the condition itself. As one woman said, I've experienced more emotional pain than the fact that my family didn't tell me the truth and about my gonads or my chromosomes. And this is a quote from a woman who's in her early 30s, looking at her medical records to discover, who, I thought she was a normal female, that she had complete androgen sensitivity, and no one had thought to share those details with her. So our goal is the potential for the best life possible. And this is a quote from Lawson Wil Wilkins, the founder of Pediatric Endocrinology. And with that, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity and thank my medic, I'm gonna start crying. Um, my colleagues and friends for over the years who've helped with this learning journey, and many of you will recognize yourself up there. I'd also like to thank my artistic directors, my grandsons, and Emily helped with writing with some of the drawings, um, Asher helped with drawings as well, um, and to our dedicated support staff, my husband, Steve, our kids. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>